Hello and good evening to our panel discussions in, in about the upcoming European elections. Um, I'm very happy that you all came and thank you as well to you, our guests, for coming and joining us tonight. Um, before we start, I have some technical advices. Um, if you prefer to hear the discussion in German, we still have some um, translation gadget things. And I think they're in the back. Are they in the back? Yes? Und nochmal auf Deutsch, falls ihr ähm, lieber auf Deutsch zuhören möchtet, weil wir werden den ganzen Abend auf äh, Englisch sprechen. Hinten sind noch von diesen, ähm, diesen Sendedingern noch welche da. Und wenn ihr äh, was trinken wollt, da hinten ist auch noch unser, ähm, das hauseigene ähm, äh, Pastell noch offen. Also wenn ihr noch was trinken möchtet, dann geht, ähm, holt euch gerne was. Das ähm, ist auch noch im Laufe der Veranstaltung offen und auch danach. Ähm, Now I have to switch again to English. Um, my name is Jana Flöchinger. I am part of the working group here at Medico on strategies against far right. And I'm also um, responsible for corporations in Latin America with our partner organizations, um, in, especially in Mexico and Central America. And I welcome you to our discussion on about the European elections, the scenarios that will await us after the 9th of June, and also about uh, counter strategies. And um, I also um, want to mention, I, um, I ha have a list here what I have to mention before we start, and it's uh, actually, we have a donation box outside, and there's also uh, lots of recent uh, publications from Medico, um, our, our um, uh, uh, our magazine um, is, uh, you can take, a, can, can take away, and um, yeah, the, um, the discussion will also be recorded, so um, just be aware of that. And if you want to, if you have a question afterwards in the Q&A and want to have it cut it out, then maybe you um, just can um, advise us. So let's start with the real event. Um, today we came here together to uh, discuss about the European elections and about counter strategies and we will examine together with our guests um, the entanglements and also the ideologies of Europe's far right and also um, the different takes um, of counter strategies especially within the migrant movement in Italy and also within the queer feminist movement um, in, in Poland. And this panel is part of a series of events of Medico here that's called Authoritarian Tipping Point or Autoritäre Kipppunkte, as you will find it online. And the concept of tipping point is actually a concept from climate change research and it refers to a kind of a point of no return. So um, the tipping point is the idea of a tipping point is that. Um, that systems change in a way and re are reorganized by destructive processes that they cannot um, change back. So it's the idea of irreversible, um, um, irreversible processes that um, um, yeah, happen, that systems change, but translated to politics and society, the idea of authoritarian um, tipping point is that once these authoritarian tipping points are crossed, the framework of pluralistic and also democratic societies become more and more fragile until a point that it might be irreversible. So when we think about these tipping points, we know that there's not just one tipping point, but um, we have to look at very different topics and issues to understand what are these authoritarian tipping points about? So we have to talk about the inhuman border regime in Europe. We have to also talk about the authoritarianism from the center. And we have to talk about anti-feminism, the control of queer and female bodies. And we also have to talk about the militarization and far-right networks here in Germany and Europe and beyond. So the tipping point series of events that we're having here at Medico is more like an ongoing discussion and I really invite you to follow this um, series of events of the tipping point, um, authoritarian tipping point um, series 
of event. Actually, in June, we will have the next um, event after the elections, where my colleague Valeria will talk about um, socio-political shifts and European, at, at European border policy, also within, with, with uh, guests from, from Poland, because we will have, or she will have, a special focus on the border between Belarus and Poland. So, um, in the upcoming elections of the European Parliament, it is very likely that radical right-wing parties are, gain, are gaining power. I think this, is, this goes without saying. And not just that, because we also have elections over here in Germany in the end of the year, and there's also a landslide victory is expected for far right, for far right, um, for far right parties in uh, in the state in the local um, elections here in Germany. But when we talk about um, authoritarian author authoritarian shifts, we cannot just talk about the far right because we also have to talk about the center actually and the governing parties. And because at the same time, politics from these centrist parties are rapidly uh, or drifting rapidly towards authoritarian or repressive um, anti democratic policies, and um, the European system and the violation of basic human rights of migrants is maybe the best example of that. So, coming to um, the topic of um, more the right wing networks. Um, here at Medico, we had a very broad discussion how to deal with the with the uh, protests that were triggered by the collective recherche, because the collective um, recherche or uh, investigation into the deportation plans of the AfD triggered a wave of protests, and um, we think that is actually a turning point. Although these protests have major shortcomings, because racism wasn't addressed, the asylum system wasn't addressed. But still, it created a spotlight and also an attention on uh, increasing, uh, increasing activities of the uh, of AfD and its allies. And I think this is a moment we have to take very seriously because there is attention, and uh, we have to uh, have to yeah we have to use this moment. Nevertheless. Um, we also know that right-wing parties and right-wing forces and networks are always and always have um, been um, active and connected beyond the national context. So far-right political parties and movements and think tanks and also media until also extremist violent groups, this all is a, is a maybe we can call uh, the far right and the different fractions of the of the far right and um, these groups or these networks wield an increasing amount of power globally. So we want to shift the focus from within the German context to a more European and global perspective. And um, because um, they are sitting in governments, they are involved in direct policy making, they campaign against human rights, they campaign against migrant rights, they deny climate change and they also try to prevent doctors to perform abortions. So in the sight of the European elections and the possibility that the far right um, far right parties will gain more votes than ever, we will have a closer look on these parties, how will they operate, what are their strategies, how do they overlap, but also how, what are the differences, and um, what are possible scenarios, um, and what impact will this also have, this, these, these different scenarios. As I mentioned, this discussion is about authoritarian tipping points, and um, authoritarian, but unlike tipping points of climate change, the tip authoritarian tip, um, tipping points is refers to social processes and social processes are always reversible. So this is actually what I maybe what makes me most uncomfortable with this concept of authoritarian tipping points because of this notion of irreversibility. But um, while threats of poly crisis are really are real and um, happening right now and we have to deal with them and the authoritarian um, backlash is is real 
um, the narratives and the public debates tend to overshadow that people and collectives all over the world globally are involved or getting involved in organizing against authoritarian attacks against democratic and social rights. And I think over here at Medico, the Medico partner organizations are actually what they do um, on a daily basis. And we, I think we don't even have to look that far in other countries because I just have to say hello and it becomes clear and it's a fact that migrant networks are bringing tens of thousands of people to the streets and uh, in fight for remembrance and justice and they're also building up alliances um, in defending a post-migrant society. So it is of course not deniable at all that the political left and the social left is currently in a very defensive position but i think this even raises more the question of counter strategies and um, the second part of tonight's discussion will be about that so before i start or before we start i first of all want to thank you for being present here taking the time uh, virtually and online and over here in, in, Frank in Frankfurt and I just let me briefly present you Magdo. Uh, Magdo, you're doing a PhD on right-wing populism in Poland over here in Frankfurt at the political science institutions and um, your research includes queer rights, gender and digital culture as well as reproductive justice and traditional family values in Europe. And you are also a queer feminist activist and a drag artist in Berlin. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Beppe, um, Beppe, you are here with us online. Thank you for taking the time. Beppe, you're part of the European and Italian left and you're also a researcher and a scholar in history and political thought. And you are among the founders of the Italian civil society, a sea rescue organization, Mediterranea, saving humans. And you are part of the medical partner organization, Maldusa. You will tell us more about Maldusa, Maldusa and the idea of Maldusa, but just to give a brief idea what Maldusa is. And Maldusa <laughs> originates from transnational sea rescue networks and is dedicated to create communities of solidarity and to document violence at the border at the Central Mediterranean Sea. Hello, Beppe. <laughs> Uli, you are working as a journalist and you've been actively engaged in anti-fascist international collaboration for a long time, very long time. And um, you're currently researching the European and the global relations um, and strategies between the AfD and also in its global context, European and global context. And I actually want to start the discussion um, with you because um, let's start with, the, um, with what is happening at the European election. So your work focuses on the entanglements of the global far right um, nevertheless, debates on the far right tends to focus on individual countries and often miss the global connection. So what can you say for the German but also for the European context because we can assume that the election will be a power shift towards the right. Um, but what are the most important right wing um, forces and what are the scenarios that are might or that might be ahead of us? Yeah, thank you um, for the invitation and thanks for the question, which is a, a huge question, I would say. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, mostly the idea is that um, these nationalist forces are uh, just taking care of their own countries, which is, I think, uh, was never quite true um, historically uh, also. but. Um, especially um, in the northern, but partly the southern hemisphere since 2017 when we saw Trump as a, as a president of the United States, we saw the shift. Um, there, something was happening that he was a big part of um, and he's still one of the famous, which is like, 
you know, the, the, the idols of, of that um, uh, global far right. Um, and he was pushing an international agenda. Um, maybe you heard of something that's called CPAC. Um, it's, a, it's a regularly um, 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 a meeting that was uh, part of the of the far right, uh, the conservative far right the, um, in, in in the in the United States, but then started to to go abroad. Uh, so um, it stands for um, 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 conservative political action uh, conference. So what is happening there is people are meeting, politicians are meeting. Um, and they are meeting to, to find out a common agenda, a common ground. Um, and um, what was then happening is that um, many, many of the far-right uh, forces in different countries, in Europe, in Latin America, um, partly in other parts of the, of the world, but not so much, um, they started to, to, to join forces and, and started to create like uh, campaigns, but on a level that is more like, you know, they agreed on something. So, um, and this is, I want to stress that out, is one of the biggest um, strengths right now is that they are like, they are united in a way and in a way that um, a global left, I think, is not. <laughs> um, so um, what you see then is that they have the possibility, and when you look at the, the recent years, you can see that there are like more or less like four topics they always like, uh, they use. When they meet, uh, when they go out into the media, when they go um, starting like election campaigns, and we, you will find that too in the election campaigns we have right now in, uh, on a European level. Is uh, anti-migration is the first one, which is always easy for them for certain reasons, and, um, and like one of their main um, uh, topics. They have a clear anti-feminist agenda, which is also partly because they are also many of those forces are also uh, coming from from a religious background which means they are like christian fundamentalists um, especially um, in the global north and um, they are anti-climate um, uh, um, activism um, so they are denying that there's a climate change made by mankind uh, going on and the fourth one is and it might be um, um, a little bit out of the picture is they are always like anti um, a global left. So they are saying there's something going on in the world that is projected and produced by a global left. They are always uh, um, talking about uh, global Marxism. Um, they are picking out people like Soros and others, um, blaming them for like um, 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 you know um, setting up like plans to um, 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 to to get people to migrate and to um, 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 and so what they are doing is especially they are building up an idea of that you have like a um, in hidden agenda in the in the in the left um, they have to react on um, they call these people they are talking about globalists so one of their main focuses right now is they are always talking about that they are working against globalism. What they understand there is that there are forces within the supranational um, um, institutions they have to um, uh, attack. So, and there might be the switch to, to Europe when you see what is going on, and also the AFD is one of those who are, who are um, uh, is also on that map. Um, they are trying to show that um, although they are they want to get into the uh, into the parliament into the European, they are saying they have to um, yeah well some of them want to really easily get rid of the United uh, the European Union, uh, some of them just want to reform them, um, and there you can see that we. <laughs> which is the, the more or less the global far right, which is the biggest picture I could draw, 
is, um, is divided into different forces when you look on the ground. Um, so we don't have like, you know, one common global network and it's not about building a new organization or something like that. They are not out to organize themselves around these issues. They are just about, you know, they give that back to the organizations and what they do with that is their turf. You know, they, they might do something with that or, or they might not. It just depends on how their national situation is. And this also is a strength, of course. It's, it does not mean you have to uh, unionize in a, in a certain, on a certain level, but everybody can do with these uh, topics what they want. And maybe to go in especially to what we, fo fo what we see right now in Europe, um, generally speaking, we have like, if you look into the, the, the right block, so everything that's right from the middle. <laughs> so you have the center-right forces, which are mainly in, in, in Europe, the Christian Democrats and their allies. This is the biggest one. Um, besides them, you have the European con conservatives and re reformers, which is more or less like, um, you know, if you, if you imagine something like the Tories, for example, with their idea of Europe, which in the end led to the Brexit, um, you will have these forces there. So you have more like people who are, like Meloni, for example, or like he's from, from Poland, who are very skeptical about the European Union and want to have more sovereignty within their own countries. And they deny that the European Union is for something like a big political idea. And even more far on the right, you have a third group which calls themselves identity and democracy, where, for example, the AFD is a member. So there you have those hardline anti-EU propagandists, which are often, not all of them, but many of them are very friendly to Putin, very friendly to Russia. Um, they reject any help in the Ukrainian-Russian um, conflict for Ukraine, for example, and other things which are the benchmarks for them. And that's the situation. So when we talk about what is going on in the European level is that we cannot only look into the hard far right but as you mentioned in the beginning, we have to look what the, what the center right is doing and how they are getting more and more attached to those forces, like especially to Maloney, um, to people like um, um, the Rassemblement National from Le Pen, for example. And um, I think this is the most um, dangerous and, and, and the most, um, I, I think, it might be one of the outcomes that we see after the, the elections. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, maybe we take a closer look to uh, Poland. And um, it's just a few months ago that peace was overthrown and defeated by at least just conservative, but not nationalist, um, conservative and Catholic um, party. And um, so your research macro focuses on right-wing populism in post-Soviet countries. And um, maybe you could give us a brief uh, overview of um, what we are talking about when we talk about far-right forces in Europe. And what, what is actually, wh where does populism end and where does fascism begin? So, um, first of all, I think peace was not really defeated. I think they were just pushed over and um, it's not over. I'm gonna say that. And so my research focuses especially in Poland, Hungary and Slovenia, as these are the countries, I mean, uh, Hungary still has Orban. Um, Slovenia had Jan who's not um, in power anymore, but uh, was also playing a lot with this anti-migrant uh, rhetoric a lot. Um, so these three countries, when we look at them, they all kind of have similar past, this socialist past, um, and were somehow connected through this transition into being a post-socialist country, and at the same time being this 
semi-peripheric region of the world, not really the West, but not really any other part, but it's just something like in between that gets overlooked a lot on many different levels. And um, from my perspective, so, as someone who grew up in Poland and, and um, you know, did, did some activism and, and did some research, I think that it really depends on certain, that there are some things that connect those countries, those post-socialist countries and, and, and their path toward um, authoritarianism, but each of the countries have their own local, regional specifics. For example, Poland is very much connected. It's, it, the, the move towards authoritarian rule or towards um, far right and these traditional family values are connected to the, the role and the power and the position of the church in the country. You cannot talk about um, you know, far right in Poland without talking about the church because one would not happen uh, without the other. So many countries um, in, in the early 90s, many countries that experienced this transition had this move, okay, so for, for example in Poland, the church was kind of uh, exonerated and, and had to have uh, their position re-established. So for example, religion classes were introduced to schools and it's till this day, it's still the reality and it's nothing is really happening with that. Um, also in Slovenia, there was just pretty much in each of those countries after the change or after the moment where the change started to happen, um, the church and right-wing movements were like, okay, now is our time, we need to push for our agenda. And for example, in Slovenia, when um, certain far-right movements started to grasp at, for example, abortion rights, um, the people of Slovenia said, no, this is something that we fought for, this is something that has been inscribed in the Slovenian constitution in 1974 already, so France was also not the first country to write abortion in constitution, very important point. Um, so people are like, no, this is something that we need to keep, this is, uh, this is our right and we need to keep this way. Whereas, for example, in Poland, I think um, that this change and this slow, um, taking away of our rights as you know people who are not white catholic men and if you just don't fall into any of these categories into the category of a white catholic or christian cis heterosexual man you are the other so this process of othering is very important in the whole debate around populism because it's the populist leader doesn't matter where it comes from always will say, you should fear this group, it's their fault that you have problems, and I'm going to protect you from them. They're the bad ones, and we're going to clean it up. Sometimes it's gay people, sometimes it's trans people, sometimes it's migrants, sometimes it's people who want to have an abortion, or people of a different belief or faith. So in each country, in each um, populist country or in each country where you see the shift to the right, you will find a group that is uh, this this other and sometimes uh, it can be a bigger group but for example in Poland it's always the LGBTQ and now that this we had this big wave of protests uh, there were uh, pro LGBTQ and we have more and more cities and towns uh, starting their own marches and starting their own activist groups now it's trans people so because it's something that is even less known and even less understood um, of course as i said in slovenia that was for example migrant people or even people from other uh, balkan countries just because uh, they came from croatia or serbia and just because of their surname they would be othered um, and then Hungary kind of combines all of those, uh, as of course it's right already in the Hungarian constitution that for example as a trans person you cannot adjust your papers to match your gender. Um, so I feel like we need to talk about why is it still possible where we have such a development of feminist scholarship why is it still possible that this hegemonic masculinity because, and racism and nationalism, because that's what it is, why is it still able to push us as a society so much 
towards fascist ideology. And um, I was also, uh, I wrote down when you were talking about the globalization, for example, uh, Polish politicians sometimes say that, oh, globalization is bad and it's actually colonization and we need to reject the notion of gender and completely misusing the term colonization and decolonization and post-colonialism, completely misusing those terms but using them. You know, but also uh, the United Right is, um, that's very true that there are certain links, for example, between um, extreme ultra-conservative religious fundamentalist institutions that have links to Brazil, for example, where we had Bolsonaro. Um, or, for example, when there was election happening, I think it was, I'm not sure now, two years ago in Hungary, uh, one of it, what this institution is called Ordo Iuris. This is a Polish fundamentalist um, institution of uh, lawyers, or they claim to be taking care of some um, jurisdictions and policies, and are uh, very close tied to to the Catholic Church, of course. They went to Hungary to be this monitoring body of the elections happening in Hungary as this uh, external kind of independent think tank, um, if you will. Um, also, I think what is happening now is guns. Uh, when you said, for example, about this ultra-right um, group, we also have in Poland, they're, uh, they're called um, Konfederacja. They're very pro-Putin, very pro-Russia, and they're very pro-guns. And um, there are, for example, establishments or institutions um, that are tied to the Republicans that have their ties all over Europe, also, for example, in Australia, that push for the change of regulations in terms of um, gun ownership, of course, to make it easier to have a gun and to make it everybody's right to walk around with a gun in their pocket. Um, and I think there is, like, as you said, also these different groups that are, some are connected over religion, some are connected over guns, and we know guns in the military industrial complex, that's huge money uh, and capital over there. Um, I think in Poland it's mostly the religious and um, ideological or because something that's also very important is that uh, the right in Poland at least but I think it's also all across just doesn't understand what gender is. They call it the gender ideology but there is no such thing. There's gender is you can have gen you can have theory on that, but it's not an ideology. So then we have this movement called anti-genderism that I also do a lot of research about, and it's this anti-feminist notion of, no, we need to reject this colonial project of telling us that there are more than two genders and we need to protect our values and we need to protect what God gave us and how God made us and anyone that is else basically has to be at some point if not pushed away, eradicated. Yes, and um, I actually I, I would like you to um, um, hear more thoughts from you about this anti-genderism because um, anti-feminism and also anti-genderism is is more than just a connecting point. It's also an entrance for many, and it connects with the toxic masculinity. So maybe you can you can explain more about the about the the function and the role of anti-feminism and anti-gendarism, um, also beyond Poland. So I think anti-gendarism is a form of othering, and it's a form of othering people who are gender non-conforming, LGBTQIA+, but also just have a feminist way of thinking. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a queer person that is a target of anti-genderism. There is anti-genderist policy making uh, happening all across, uh, all across Europe, for example, banning um, abortions in Poland, or what I mentioned earlier, this um, change of the uh, Hungarian constitution to limit trans people's rights. Um, 
And there are many, many examples of anti-genderist policies, and these could be also policies that maybe in the first moment, when you look at them, are not necessarily um, anti-genderist, but then when you really think about how they work and what they, um, how they privilege certain groups over others, you see that it's actually not about um, helping people, but it's about, again, kind of, um, targeting a certain group. Um, and this anti-genderist policy making, I think is some, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool. And I think it's something that it's not named as anti-genderist poli policy making by those who do the, or prepare these policies or push for these policies. Of course, they're not gonna say, oh, we're doing this anti-genderist policy or whatever. But um, it's something that you can uh, notice from the outside. And for example, the, there was um, the, the parliamentary um, group or commission on reproductive rights in Poland. I, I, I think there is a new one already, but uh, it, was, it consisted of 12 men, 12 or something like that men. People will never be pregnant, never would need an abortion, never know nothing about that. But they cannot let people who might have this experience speak. And it's, it's kind of ousting these voices and just privileging voices that can uphold this structure of patriarchy and a structure that privileges those who subscribe to these traditional family values because this is the only way how we can uphold this pure, white, Catholic body of our nation. Um, and I think that anti-genderism is something that is probably also widely misunderstood, but is much more dangerous than some might think. And it's something that needs to be studied even further. And it's also not something that appeared just yesterday because um, for example, in Poland, there were there were previously already uh, certain policies that were targeting queer people, or even when I was in school, there was this policy that um, blocked all the websites that contained words like LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or whatever. All those websites you could not access from a computer, from a school computer. And it's just also, you know, meddling with access to um, information. And it's something that today, that was like probably 15 years ago or more, uh, but today we're in a different point with, um, in terms of communication and how, and the channels of communication that we have. And that's why when you ask, for example, okay, where, where does populism end and fascism start? I think there is no clear cut where it is. It's just very, it's not clear. And fascism will not, I think that fascism today is not gonna be what we had in the interwar period. And it's gonna spread in a completely different way. And we need to also acknowledge that. And um, not by banning TikTok, it's not going to help. <laughs> That's the opposite, I think, of that. But for sure, we need more of something that's called media com median competence in German. So like media, uh, being well-versed in media, but also social media and internet, because I think this is exactly where a lot of people who have extremely far-right um, views or beliefs come together and anyone can just publish their own right-wing manifesto or harass people online over something they said that they don't like. Yeah, thank you. I think what's very crucial to, to really keep in mind is that anti-feminism and anti-genderism anti anti is actually really a core element of fascist right-wing thought because it actually contains this traditional, not just family values, but the whole idea of how society should or should work. Um, whereas peace was pushed back, as you said, 
um, Meloni is still in power, so um, in Italy it's actually a post-fascist um, government and um, this raises a lot of questions and it's, um, it's not just dangerous but it's, um, it's really frightening. And uh, globally, the far right has become much more bolder and much more radical um, over the time. And we see a kind of um, a normalization in, um, in the equality, inequality, in racism, in border regimes. And what passes for normal nowadays um, was actually uh, um, what, what is used by Viktor Orban, by Bolsonaro and also Donald Trump would have been just considered a domain of the far right in the 90s. So this shift also shows a normalization of right wing or of even fascist um, narratives. But um, the normalization of, the, of these narratives is not just a problem concerning uh, rhetoric, rhetoric um, issues or rhetoric questions um, because it works on erasing anti-fascism from history, it shapes public attention and politics and it's happening already in policy making. The European border regime might be the best example for it. So, um, uh, Beppe, how is Fratelli d'Italia um, and especially Meloni contributing to this kind of normalization of post-fascism in Italy and beyond of Italy? And, and what does this social, what does this normalization mean for social movements? Uh, thank, thank you, Jana. Thank you, Medico, for uh, the invitation and for this uh, opportunity to share. I think that. Uh, your history or your interest uh, on the Italian case uh, is uh, both uh, based uh, on the role that uh, undoubtedly Meloni is playing uh, on the international and especially in the articulation of power relationships in the European Union and on the other hand of the fact that uh, Italy was the uh, fatherland uh, of fascism was the, the place uh, where fascism was invented in the 20s. And, and we know that uh, history never repeats uh, itself uh, in, the same, uh, in the same way, but we have to consider. Uh, I would like uh, to address, uh, in order to answer uh, your question, uh, mostly uh, the ambiguity, let's say the, the double discourse of uh, Meloni. Because I think this is uh, the most tricky fact uh, and uh, the real danger related uh, to uh, her role and the role of the incumbent Italian government uh, on the European level. Just uh, uh, recall briefly a most recent history and let's say that uh, the normalization of the post-fascist party in Italy did not start with uh, the September 2022 elections, but started with uh, the ambiguous attitude uh, even during the so-called First Republic uh, toward the fascist party, no? the, the party called MSE, Movimento Sociale Italiano, that uh, was founded uh, with this uh, direct reference uh, to the Repubblica Sociale Italiana, Italian Social Republic, the uh, Quisling state uh, allied uh, with Nazis uh, in the north of Italy between 1943 and 1945. And the leader that is still uh, uh, is still the 
historical point of reference of Meloni and uh, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy Party, uh, Giorgio Almirante, was a, a war criminal in the Second World War, was uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, the defense of the race, that was the theoretical magazine of the fascist regime claiming uh, for the Holocaust, claiming for the discrimination of the Jews in Italy. And uh, personally was also responsible uh, of uh, uh, targeted repression uh, of uh, partisan struggles. This is uh, not uh, a secondary point. Uh, we have to take in account that uh, in the long Italian history of the second after war, there is uh, a kind of uh, permanent self-indulgence with uh, the same Italian history. Uh, it's like to say that uh, the fact that we have a strong uh, anti-fascist uh, resistance movement, uh, the resistance movement uh, uh, played a strong role uh, for the liberation of Italy uh, in April 1945 uh, together with uh, the allied military forces. It's like the justification for all the nation in the relationship with uh, uh, its uh, uh, past uh, uh, fascist 20, 20 years of uh, fascist uh, uh, regime. And it's the same self-indulgence that you have in the Italian public opinion related to the colonial history of Italy. Uh, with a kind uh, of amnesty related uh, to uh, the violent colonial history in uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and uh, uh, not forget it, uh, with Libya. And this self-indulgence uh, is also part uh, of uh, the uh, current uh, justification of uh, uh, the role played by Italy uh, with uh, the um, European external uh, borders uh, management. In this sense, uh, uh, let's say that Meloni is part of a long history. And uh, just to be very brief, uh, 1994 was a crucial year when there was uh, the first Berlusconi government uh, and Berlusconi played a crucial role in legitimizing the uh, post-fascist party as a possible coalition partner in uh, uh, government. So we have not to be so surprised of what happened uh, with uh, the general political election of September 2022. What is... Uh, uh, I think quite crucial for our discussion is exactly the double discourse of Meloni. If we read uh, the book uh, I am Georgia, so Io sono Georgia, uh, published by Meloni in 2021, you can exactly find all the set of ideas that uh, both uh, Magdo and Dulli presented to us uh, as uh, uh, typical identity point of the far right at global and at European level and particularly in the Eastern Europe. You will find in this book of 2021 all the discourses against feminism, against climate, against globalism, including also the full theory of the great replacement, a full theorization by Meloni regarding uh, the risk of ethnic uh, substitution for Europe and uh, for Italy. So 
no one of the typical ideological points of the far right on global and European level are missed in uh, the Meloni discourse. But at the same time, Ons being uh, president of the Council of Ministers, it means the Italian Prime Minister, she immediately started an approach trying to be fully legitimated from the point of view of the relation with big economic powers on internal level and international level and a strong legitimation from the point of view of foreign policy and international relationship. Uh, for Meloni to be part uh, of uh, an, uh, let's say, an Atlantic, uh, a strongly pro-American uh, view of Europe is crucial. And from this point of view, we can find the ambiguity in relationship of the discourse uh, uh, with other populistic uh, far rights uh, all uh, around the Europe. She, she's uh, really trying uh, to be accepted uh, in uh, the global high uh, society, in the global elite, uh, as uh, a reliable partner of uh, the global elite. And so we can, uh, of course, uh, analyze this uh, uh, big contradiction with the previous uh, anti-globalist uh, uh, discourse uh, that is, in the same time, a contradiction that we have uh, to work uh, <coughs> to work on. Um, a final point uh, in relationship uh, with uh, the migration policies uh, that we will discuss the counter strategies in the second part of our conversation. Let's say that uh, the identity politics uh, of the Meloni government uh, is mostly focused uh, on uh, the traditional concept of family, uh, in uh, anti-families, in uh, uh, a direct attack uh, on the autodetermination rights uh, of women, in an ideological attack against uh, the civil rights uh, of uh, LGBTQI plus uh, people, in uh, uh, countering uh, in a very negationist way uh, the discourse related uh, to uh, uh, the climate crisis and the demand of climate justice. Regarding migration, we can also find a double discourse. And from this point of view, the responsibilities of the centre-left in Italy are enormous. Because all the externalisation, the border externalisation strategy was started in 2017 exactly by the Ministry of Interior Miniti of the last centre-left government uh, with uh, Prime Minister Gentiloni. The first agreement with the Libyan militias, the deliver of uh, patrol boats to the Libyan militias, uh, the uh, financing of detention camps and uh, activities of uh, interception, capture and deportation at sea, by the Libyan militias was started by the Democratic Party interior minister. So the street for Meloni and for her junior partner Salvini was opened by the center-left migration policies. What does it mean? It means that now Meloni is simply replying the business model with Libya, also with Tunisia, with the regime of Kais Sayed, with Egypt, with uh, the regime of Al-Sisi, with Algeria, and also exporting <coughs> this model to the sub-Saharan Africa in the attempt, uh, in a strong 
cooperation with uh, van der Leyen in the attempt to uh, push the southern border of the European Union even to Mali, to Chad, to Niger, in this permanent attempt uh, to uh, outsource the border control, outsource uh, the pushbacks, outsource uh, the deportation of people uh, elsewhere. And in the same time, having this ambiguity, this double discourse, strong cooperation with von der Leyen about the Migration Pact, campaigning against von der Leyen in the Vox International Meeting in Madrid. I think that this kind of tactics are really danger and we have to discuss how it's possible to counter it. Thank you, Beppe. And I think this also makes clear what you said in the beginning that uh, Meloni and other, that, that this, this fraction of um, those far right um, fractions that try to integrate into the European Union and those who actually try to abolish it. And I think uh, the Italian and Meloni's um, uh, migrant politics is actually making it very clear why she or Fratelli d'Italia needs actually the European Union. And um, what you just said, um, Bebe, I just um, I think it's very important um, to, to mention this, that uh, some right-wing movements and parties in Europe actually cut with its fascist ties, as it, in the case of AfD, it originates from a um, uh, from a more uh, anti-EU, economically, economically liberal ideologies and others actually strongly and openly relate to a fascist past. And what also becomes clear um, hearing all the three um, different um, contexts is that um, other than the, the old fascism or the, the historical um, fascism or fascist movements, um, the global far right nowadays is not promoting a new world, a new idea. It's more promoting a reactionary idea of traditional values and an idea of uh, a concept of living that actually, um, yeah, maybe never truly existed. But in this reactive um, sense, it's attempting to resist or to push back against something. Um, and I think this is an um, important difference between the historical fascism and the global far right that we uh, have today or that we um, observe today. Um, we are running a little uh, short on time, um, but I want to talk about now about counter strategies. And I want to continue with you, um, Magdo. And you already mentioned it um, that uh, Nowadays, or in, in, also in the recent years, um, um, LGBTIQ um, protests, pride protests were emerging also in very small cities, not just in um, not just in the the, the bigger um, um, urban areas. And um, but I also um, I think it's also important to mention that the most important feminist mobilizations in Poland in recent year were also the feminist strike movements in 2016. Uh, when the when also in Spain and in Argentina this global strike movement um, was emerging and was renewing um, itself, it was a transnational strike movement, and um, Poland was is a really super important reference in this um, context. And then to 2020, when the abortion ban um, came into law again, there was a huge um, protest and there was huge um, feminist um, queer feminists. Um, um, for, um, demonstrations, and my questions to you in the in the sense of counter strategies, and uh, also take keeping in mind that peace is pushed back, but there's still um, a very thick layer of conservative and Catholic um, value and thing and thinking, but still it was it, it was a very important. Um, uh, it was a very important goal um, um, for feminist and queer feminist movements. So how did the Polish feminist movements manage to strengthen actually a, ready, a, ra a radical movement for queer and women rights 
And beyond that, actually, it wasn't just about queer and women rights, but to keep it a little more simple, um, become a real counter movement to the long established Catholic patriarchal um, forces. So I think that, I mean, for example, I remember in 2020 when some of the biggest um, protests were happening uh, against the abortion ban. Um, there are people who would bring rainbow flags to the protests and there were people who were kind of offended by this. They were offended by the presence of a rainbow flag and they were asking, why do you always have to make it about the LGBTQ community? Why do you always have to appear everywhere? But I think with time, people understood that these struggles are interconnected. And at some point, these movements, because in 2020, we also had a lot of um, protests, uh, these rainbow protests uh, around also these LGBTQI a plus free zones that still exist in Poland, less and less, but they still exist in Poland. Um, and I think a lot of people saw that, okay, the more people we can mobilize, the more we understand how interconnected our struggles are, um, the more power we have. Uh, and I think that this, this um, protest movement really, um, started to spread also online and, and got to a lot of people who maybe didn't live in big cities and there were also protests organized in smaller cities just like we see every year more and more uh, pride marches organized all across Poland. Although Poland has, for the fifth year in a row, according to the ILGA Europe, uh, we're the worst country in the European Union in terms of you know, uh, LGBTQIA plus rights. And there is another study that says that Poland, in terms of being sa as a, a safe travel destination for queer people, is in uh, place 118 globally. So it's really, really low. Um, and I think more people got kind of um, understood the, the interconnections of the struggles. And we also have younger generations entering the activist movement. And during these debates around the abortion ban uh, and LGBTQI plus rights, we saw the position of the church. And I think a lot of people who kind of belong to the church, but maybe were not very regular visitors, or however you want to call that, maybe they were not very tied to it. Um, saw how harmful of an institution the church can be. So there was, there is still a big movement of people uh, turning away from the church. So it, it, it's kind of like a wave that, is, that we still observe, that we still see is happening, although the protests are not happening in itself anymore. But there is more understanding, there is more education in terms of, for example, reproductive health and reproductive rights. Um, there is more movement around these topics, but it comes really from the community and from the, I would say at the core of it is the queer feminist community. And then at the level of the government or just political parties, there is this feeling of nothing is really happening despite the change, the government change that we had. There is, we, there are people, there are activists who are trying to hold the new government accountable. The government that said within the first hundred years, we're going to take care of the civil unions for queer people, we're going to take care of the abortion, and nothing happened. And probably nothing's going to happen for a really long time. Um, so I think it really needs resilience and it needs um, building of. Uh, communities and organizations of mutual aid that are completely independent from the governmental position. And um, sometimes you need a bigger movement for people to realize um, about who actually are we opposing. And I think, for example, when we see the protests at, uh, across the globe at universities who are against the occupation of Palestine, that's also like this movement that maybe some people 
are going to educate themselves more on the topic. Maybe they're going to talk more about it. Maybe they're going to get into it a bit more. And I think this is also like a similar wave to what happened in 2016 with um, abortion rights. I think what is very crucial in the feminist movements in Poland is that it actually came together the the traditional women movement and the queer movement because this is actually one of the very strong weak point of feminist movements that this is actually not going together and I think the threat was so um, clear and it was the, the patriarchic logic behind the LGBTIQ free zones and uh, the abortion ban was so clear that it maybe was easier to bring those together. Um, Beppe, I um, I would like to um, go back to Italy and to um, to the significance of migrant movements um, and uh, Maldusa, as I already um, uh, explained very shortly, um, is a grassroots migrant organization, and in your daily work, you contribute to existing constellations of search and rescue. Uh, actors and being together with, uh, and bring together um, different realities and creating new conversations, new alliances, alliances between them. And um, in an interview, um, one of um, a member of Madusa explained that many of you started dreaming of building an island in the Mediterranean Sea named Madusa, where people could arrive and be free. So this. Okay. More, to be more precise, uh, was uh, uh, a migrant, a people, uh, people, a person on the board in distress, uh, calling Alan Fawn. Yeah, that's, that's they, the story. We are, we are in yeah. the middle of the Mediterranean, yeah. we are lost, uh, and uh, the Alan Fawn uh, yeah. activist uh, asked uh, him or her but where you are going. Uh, and they say the mixing of the name of Malta and the name of Lampedusa mix it and say, I, we want to go to that island in Europe, uh, the Maldusa island, you know? And so was a migrant inventing, uh, not, not one of our activists, but a migrant inventing uh, directly the name. Well, the Maldusa is, the migrants are, are um, Maldusa consists of migrants as well. And um, actually I wanted to ask you to tell this anecdote because it, um, it I don't know, it's, I think it's a very um, plastic uh, picture um, that um, resembles this um, idea of an island um, where people can be, can could arrive and be free. Um, but besides this um, anecdote, maybe you can talk or explain more about the project Maldusa and what is your goal at Maldusa, what is your, what are you working towards? But let, let's say that uh, also this anecdote uh, is telling us something uh, about the idea of uh, Europe as political and social space uh, we have, you know, because usually we are all very critical uh, about uh, the European Union institution, uh, the European Union policies and so on, and, and also and the, the idea itself of Europe lost uh, uh, in the past few years uh, most uh, of uh, its uh, appeal. Uh, but we have in the, in some time, in the same time uh, to consider that uh, Europe is still, for a lot of people from outside, of the European borders, uh, a place uh, where uh, it, it's better to live, where it's possible to imagine uh, a different future, where it's possible to imagine uh, a different life, uh, particularly coming uh, from uh, Africa, Middle East, uh, Far East, uh, and passing through uh, the, the real hell that uh, situation like uh, the detention camp in Libya or the anti-black racist uh, pogroms uh, in Tunisia are currently. 
And from this point of view, uh, what Malduza is trying to do is to put uh, the people on the move uh, protagonism at the center of our project. Uh, you correctly, Jana, remember that uh, there are a lot of migrants uh, which are active uh, in Maldusa. This is not usual in the uh, search and rescue civil uh, organization. Uh, what uh, we think uh, is that uh, the, the goal and in the same time the narrative of the freedom of movement uh, uh, the fundamental right uh, uh, for a human mobility has to be in the center also of the discourse uh, regarding uh, what is going on uh, uh, on the central Mediterranean uh, route uh, of migration. Uh, sure, we insist a lot uh, uh, on the, the real result of the European Union institution and member state migration policies. Most of the suffering, most of the violence, most of the death that transformed the Central Mediterranean Sea in one of the largest open sky graveyard in the world are exactly the result of such European Union and member state policies. But in the same time, we have to consider that the Mediterranean Sea is also the space of potential freedom for people on the move trying to open uh, passages uh, to enter the European uh, Union external, external borders. In this sense, uh, in the practice and in the narrative of the Mandusa project, we put at the center the support uh, of this uh, real struggle to overcome the European borders the support uh, to the practice of the freedom of movement and is practically articulated in two land uh, monitoring and observation and even uh, support, legal support, uh, informational and legal support stations, uh, both in Palermo and in Lampedusa and uh, in a fast uh, boat, ready to intervene uh, from the port of Lampedusa uh, to assist the uh, boat in distress coming from Tunisia and Libya and uh, to push for the direct uh, intervention of rescue by the Italian authorities uh, to the safe port of Lampedusa. This is one of the main points uh, that uh, we are uh, facing with uh, the lack of assistance, the refusal of assistance, particularly by the Maltese authorities or by the Italian authorities uh, uh, in relationship uh, with uh, people in distress uh, in, uh, international, in the international waters. And uh, last but not least, uh, to witness, to document, to denounce uh, the permanent violations of uh, basic uh, right of the people uh, which are happening uh, day by day in uh, the central Mediterranean area. Thank you, um, Beppe. I think it's, um, I think what makes Malusa so special is that it's actually, it's hands-on support, but it also has a u utopian horizon. And I think this is, um, this is um, something that is not easy to build. And it is possible, I guess, um, when we start building something like that from the experiences of the people. Um, I want to close our discussion, coming back to the elections that we are actually talking about. And um, Uli, 
um, since many years, and um, we witnessed several peaks of far-right terrorism here in Germany, and uh, you work in anti-fascist networks and research, and uh, tonight we learned about um, practice and anti-fascist practice um, or counter strategies in Italy and in Poland. And, um, but what, what's also clear is elections are just one point. There's something happening before, there's something happening after that. It's not, it's not un never un it's unexpected or never surpri or seldomly surprises. But um, still, I have to ask the question, what works and what doesn't work in the face of elections? So what is, what, what is, do we have to watch it happen? Or is there something that we can do? Or is there something we have to talk about? Um. <clears throat> Well, yes, absolutely. I think um, when we look into the um, um, European elections, um, what we witnessed um, um, in recent months was that uh, in all the surveys, it was clear that those who were the most mobilized uh, electorate have been the, um, the far right. Um, um, so what we see is they clearly understand that this makes a difference to go to, to the elections and to get their votes. Um, this also means one of the very simple counter strategies is go vote. Um, I have problem to, to well, to just um, only to have this simple message. But that's it. It's really, and and I think this one, this is also one of the weaknesses um, left, at least in Germany, has partly um, to be so so much um, against or opposite of uh, what is going on in in, in Europe um, that they don't dare to um, to speak out loud and to say go 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 voting. It's 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 a good idea to do that. Um, um, so it's it's difficult, but it's also the nearly the same when we look into the the, the state elections we have we face in, in autumn or, or late uh, summer in three countries um, or three, three states in, in East uh, Germany. Um, it will make a di difference if, if people go there and and and, and vote. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm coming from from a from a movement and, and from my work. We have often, you know, one of the core um, works we we are doing is monitoring and um, and looking into what the, the the far right is doing globally and also on a European level. Let me say it clearly: um, the German left has no idea of what is going on. Um, I'm really sorry to say that, but you know, even you know, since I, I'm doing the work with this focus, I'm learning that many people, even those who are close to like democratic institutions or are like in, are in in the core of parties, they really don't know what is happening on the ground, and there is nearly no monitoring on on that issue. It's it's not happening. Um, there are some media who are covering it, but it's also like mostly random. We faced, like last weekend, we had a meeting in, um, in, in Madrid, and, and Pepe uh, mentioned it. Um, you know, we had like, you know, we had Melee from Argentina. We had, we had the, the meeting in, in, in Spain with Fox. We had um, people there like uh, Kast, who is the leader of the far right in, in Chile. We had Orban from Hungary, we had Meloni there, we had Le Pen from France. And, and all these people came together there claiming that they have a common ground and they want the same in the elections, which is really, this is groundbreaking. It's not, it did not happen before in that scale. And we are not prepared for that. We, don't, we, we did not know that it will happen like that. And this is a problem. And still, we don't have the AFD there, which is for us is a good um, uh, news. Um, and um, it could be so. To say that it could be worse, and it will get worse. And uh, we are just 
we are at the beginning of what is going on as a in, in ways of you know the the the, um, the building of a far right block in Europe and in the European um, um, Parliament. It's not just in the middle or in the end or something like that. We're just looking right now what is going to happen. And this is the problem. And I think what we need is more like direct and really critical opposition against what is going on there. Um, there were like some hundred anti-fascists protesting in Madrid this weekend uh, against a, a conference that was um, attended by like, I don't know, 6,000, something around that. I don't know. It's, this was the, the, the picture. And this is not enough. <laughs> What we need is a, is, a, is really a, um, an answer from the from the, from the left that is anti-authoritarian, and I say that because I think anti-fascist or just claiming that these are all fascist movements that are, that are meeting there is not the way to address that. We will not be able to convince people by saying these are all Nazis, and. We have to we have to attack that this is an authoritarian project and not a fascist project. It's, it's all true what what was said here today in connection with the historical fascism, etc. But if we want to have uh, an approach to to attack them, we need a more broad perspective. What was happening like in other countries, and we have to get involve more people than just, you know, the radical far left. We need more people. And um, so I think um, we need to have an, um, a campaign that is uh, around what the far right is projecting right now. And I don't see that right now, but it's something we need. And, and so maybe the last one, what we saw in the protest because of the meeting in Potsdam, and um, it was not, it was part of that. And I think this is a start, and somehow to, to get people on the streets, because they think that the project of the AFD, and that was for the first time, was not against the AFD as a far-right party, it was against their specific political project that was popping up in this research. And this is also new. We never had such a broad alliance against not only the party or that there's violence happening or terrorism happening, but against the political project that they are standing for. So I think this is, this is politically speaking, this is more mature than many of other uh, protests that we have seen before. And I would like to people to go think more in that direction and to go on in that way because this might turn out to be such an anti-authoritarian uh, opposition that might really make a difference. Thank you. Um, I would like to open now um, for comments, questions. Can I just say something? Of course. Because it's yeah. to what you just said. Uh, I just had this thought that, you know, these uh, authoritarian leaders of, of far right and whatever, if it's uh, Orban or Meroni or Le Pen, we also have now women be, you know, it's like the epitome of feminism. We have now women who are authoritarian leaders, hooray. Um, but those people, they have something that they can promise to people who feel like maybe their life is not great now, they're living in the crisis, inflation, and everything is not great. Um, and those leaders say, hey, this is the solution, and this is these people's fault. Whereas anything that's from the center to the left, there is nothing to offer. There is only very, a lot of like, I mean, we're sitting here and talking, you know, um, we also have some experience on the ground, I'd say. Um, but there is a lot of people who are just theorizing and are completely excluding the masses of people that just don't feel addressed by the left today. And I think this is a really big problem. This is exactly uh, what you say, that we need a bigger movement to um, motivate people and tell them, okay, this is what might happen, this is the danger, and this is what we need to counteract against. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's actually, 
I totally agree what you said. Uh, the, the mass movements they had their shortcomings, of course, but still, it, lots of people. There is a potential, but there's no no answer. There's not nothing to to connect it to. So, yeah, the big question of uh, leftist counter strategies. Um, I would like to open now for questions and comments <laughs> to the to our guests. Ja, vielleicht, ich mache es auf Deutsch, vielleicht ähm, könnten wir ähm, ausgehend von, äh, von hier, von Deutschland, äh, mal analysieren, wie hier vorgegangen wird. Äh, und äh, zwar ähm, möchte ich die, diese Strategie der, der, des ähm, Mosaik äh, Rechtsseins äh, ansprechen. Wir haben ja jetzt hier äh, am kommenden Samstag auch eine entsprechende Demo äh, auf dem Opernplatz, äh, heute in der Rundschau jedenfalls angekündigt. Ähm, also, äh, dass alle, ähm, dass Reichsbürger, AfD, Identitäre, äh, total äh, Gewalttäter von rechts und, und noch mehr äh, äh, zusammen agieren. Genau, und natürlich auch immer international ähm, äh, auch vernetzt sind, äh, aber diese Mosaikrechte finde ich wichtig ähm, zu beleuchten und inwieweit das in den anderen Ländern auch ist, äh, könnte ja auch besprochen ähm, werden. Genau, danke. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Sabine, I'm working for Medico. I liked your uh, suggestion, Uli, of having an anti-authoritarian campaign. But at the same time, I was wondering, um, given that we observe a big temptation to authoritari authoritarianism <laughs> in the middle of society, uh, how to reach those we want to reach, we should reach, instead of Uh, trying to, to convert the conversed. Um, this is the point I think we have to reflect on how to reach those who are pro protein because they think authoritarian. <laughs> I did the word. Also, also, I can't, I can't. It's uh, a uh, promising concept in order to bring some order to that confusing world. I will just translate the question for you, Beppe, um, that was in German. Um, <clears throat> she said that parting from the German context, um, she wanted to ask about the strategy of the Mosaic far right, because it, uh, the upcoming weekend there uh, will be protests from a very broad alliances of uh, far right wing um, actors here in Frankfurt. And she was wondering if here in if um, other than in Frankfurt and other countries um, this idea of a, a mosaic far right is also existing. So we have the question of the authoritarianism, the attraction of the authoritarianism from the center, and the question um, about the mosaic far right. Who wants to start addressing? Um, yeah. Um, so maybe um, about the you know this um, what is in Germany called the mosaic far right or the mosaic rechte. Um, yeah, I think well we always had all these different parts of the far right and um, and maybe there are some new and some are very old <laughs> and some are very attractive and others are not so very much. And um, I, from my perspective, um, you can't compare it all to with other countries. But of course, there are specific developments that attract specific answers also from the far right. So when they change in their ideology or in their organizational stru structure, 
it's not just about some idea or some books they read, but it's also it's a, it's an it's an answer on uh, um, also on political crises they 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 face. Um, so we had all these people uh, going on the streets uh, during the uh, pandemic crisis, and they had specific answers. Uh, we had this in in various countries. So I would say, yeah, there there, there is something to compare. But um, on the other hand, it's like um, what we see right now is, for example, when you look into the AFD, which is the most um, powerful part of the far right right now, um, what what is part of their, um, um, their um, success is that they, they are able to collect all these voices together within their party project. And um, as an anti-fascist, I would always say it's good if, they, if you can devise them into their parts again. So this is something anti-fascists should try, um, to, to cut these into pieces again and to, to force them to split, because there are possibilities to do that and they are as long as they are moving they are good because the movement is always giving them strength and power but as as in the in, in the moment they are starting to um, to focus like internal conflicts it's always good uh, so we should try to to enforce something like that and on the other hand yes you're right of course authoritarianism is not always only a project of the far right and I'm also like skeptical about um, this will work <laughs> um, and, and at least because I think authoritarianism is not only an idea of the far right but it's a very constant and very good working answer from yeah I think from the heart of the imperialism to um, answer um, to a global crisis. You, 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 you're trying everything to keep people out of your country and out of your way of life and your way of wealth. It's, it's easy like that. And if you, if, you, if you give people that possibility that they can have it or the, the idea or the vision, of course, many of those who are now um, not, don't have a problem with, it, with what is the system here right now, um, will be attracted by that, of course. So this, this is the main attraction of this project. It's not that it's a far-right project, but it, it's a project that keeps my wealth and my position there where, where it is. So it's not, that's also why not everyone now from the, um, from, um, from the, from the centrist or even the liberal uh, parts of the, uh, um, the um, societies are also um, for kind of that authoritarian answer. Does not mean they all became fascist right now, but they are all clearly seeing that they need this answer vitally to live or to keep their countries as they are. So it's, it's a self-protectionist uh, way. So yes, I don't know the answer, but I think um, this is part of the problem we, we are all facing. Thank you, Pepe. You want you also wanted to say something? Yes, thanks. But let's say that uh, uh, um, about the first first question regarding the mosaic uh, uh, right, um, the Meloni government is a coalition government. It means that uh, uh, the Fratelli d'Italia, the Brothers of Italy party, has uh, two junior partners, which are uh, on the on the center side, uh, the former Berlusconi's uh, party, that is Forza Italia, member of the European Popular Party. It means uh, allied of uh, CDU. And on the other hand, uh, uh, there is a junior party, the, the Lega uh, of Salvini. Just to give you an idea about the electoral proportion, uh, uh, Fratelli d'Italia, Meloni's party, is uh, between uh, 25 and 27 in the polls. Uh, 
um, both uh, Forza Italia, Berlusconi party and uh, uh, the Lega of Salvini are around 8.5%. Uh, who is currently playing the role of, uh, of course, Forza Italia is a pro-establishment party, but who is playing the role of the far-right, uh, more aggressive, or more extremistic uh, party is the Lega of Salvini in a permanent uh, competition uh, with, uh, with Meloni and also using uh, all the attempts uh, of Meloni in, in the direction of normalization, legitimation, to try to get more consensus uh, on, on the right wing. Just to give you an example, um, the Lega is currently uh, one of the Spitzenkandidaten uh, of Lega, is now a, a general of the army, who published uh, a pamphlet uh, full of uh, homophobic, uh, anti-feminist, uh, racist, uh, the all possible catalog of uh, uh, right-wing uh, eight uh, common uh, common places, no? And also migration, no? Salvini is trying to compete uh, with uh, with Meloni. No, considering that, uh, and this is the point uh, regarding the second question, considering that uh, migration is a contradiction for Meloni. In 2023, the number of arrivals by sea of disembarkation of landings in Italy was the highest of the last uh, five years with about 160,000 people arriving in Italy by sea and a very few percentage uh, were the people rescued by the uh, symbolic enemy of uh, Meloni uh, who are the, us, the, the NGOs, the civil, the civil fleet. In the same time, Meloni has to respond to the request of the Industrial Bosses Association to have more than 450,000 new migrants to Italy for the needs of the Italian capitalistic labor market. This is just to say that uh, if we are talking about counter strategies, uh, what uh, is uh, the point of weakness uh, we have uh, to attack? Is this uh, structural relationship uh, between uh, the far right in government and uh, the neoliberal uh, compatibility, systematic uh, system compatibilities? Because uh, if the promise of the far right in government uh, is uh, as only correct, uh, correctly said, the promise of protection, the promise of addressing the multiple crises, the promise of addressing uh, the insecurity sense of most of the people. This uh, structural relationship uh, with neoliberal economic and social policies uh, is uh, the point of weakness of them. They cannot accomplish uh, such uh, promise. They cannot accomplish uh, such a desire of uh, social protection uh, by most of the people in our countries uh, if uh, they are uh, the real watch, uh, watchdog uh, of neoliberal uh, social and economic uh, policies and so this is i think uh, one of course uh, uh, together with the struggle for civil political human rights uh, this is the point we have to address if you want to gain again a majority uh, to uh, exclude uh, uh, the far right and to win such a battle 
Thank you, Pepe. Juanjo? Um, I just want to say, like, one of the weaknesses, I think, is hypocrisy. Because a lot of uh, politicians, I mean, I'm sure that a lot of far-right politicians all across the globe truly believe in what they talk about and, and the values, but many of them just say certain things to gain power. And then on one hand, they communicate something, but then in the back rooms, something completely else is happening. Like, for example, in Poland, we had this case where you know, there is a major humanitarian crisis on the Polish-Belarusian border, and the government was uh, building fences, and there is a lot of um, army officers there. It's very dangerous. People are dying. If activists who help people who are being found in the forest uh, are being punished, and so on and so forth. At the same time, uh, you could buy a visa in certain countries of, so to say, origin of these migrants. You could buy a visa that was provided by the official, for example, consulate or embassy of Poland. And there is a major investigation going on because that happened during the peace rule. Um, that's, that's just one example. But there are many like those. So I think really saying um, or showing to the people, okay, this is what they say, but this is what they do. But that requires investigation, that requires exposing these networks of people who claim to have the you know the livelihood, the good livelihood of the people actually in the center of their interests, that it's actually not true. They only care about themselves. <coughs> And it's also similar to when you have, for example, an, an authoritarian leader on Twitter, and there are plenty of them, they, you can re, um, develop a certain parasocial relationship with those leaders, just like with celebrities and others, and you might have this feeling, of, oh, the leader is going to answer my question, but actually they just use it as a, as a megaphone for boosting their own personalities and their own uh, rule, and that's how they then... Um, normalize voicing certain opinions and make it okay to say, for example, that all trans people should die. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I just want to add one point to what you said um, as well, um, Beppe, the, this, the, the promise of security, it also raises the question of psychosocial processes within this and psychosocial um, dynamics within right-wing discourses because the left has better arguments, but we don't have a strategy, and um, and it's I don't know I think it's um, it's very important also to to take into account that um, this this what you said um, that uh, this 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 promise of security and um, and the fear has to be dismantled at at some point, and. Um, yeah, I think we come to an end now and I want to close this um, panel discussion. Thank you very much for, for being here. I think it was very important um, to uh, um, take a closer look what is actually happening in Europe and um, also to dismantle the idea of this is the far right because it makes it also much more harder to, to think about uh, counter strategies when you don't have a clear idea what are the fractions, what are um, the uh, the the, the um, overlaps and also the differences in um, in the uh, far right. Um, thank you all for coming here and um, listening for two hours <laughs> to uh, the panel discussion. And um, there's just one info that we have outside still some um, magazines. That's, there's the recent magazine of Medico, um, that's, um, you can just take it with you. There's also other merchandise and um, other brochures and information on, um, uh, on different um, topics. And um, the, we still have um, the bar open and the back, so feel free to stay here and um, take a beer. And um, we will be here for another while. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And see you soon. Thank you so much.